How are we doing today? Good, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're just gonna give folks a minute to come in from the waiting room. And as a reminder, when you are entering from the waiting room, please do remain on mute unless or until you are appearing or testifying before the board. Give just another minute. Looks like folks are still trying to join in from the waiting room. Good morning. This is a hearing before the licensing board for the city of Boston. Today is Tuesday, August 23rd, 2022. Today's hearing is being held pursuant to temporary amendments to the open meeting law. That is what allows us to meet virtually. Today's hearing is being recorded and will be posted to the City of Boston website. Before I review procedural matters, I will introduce Chairwoman Kathleen Joyce. Thank you, Danny. Good morning. My name is Kathleen Joyce. I'm chair of the Boston Licensing Board, and today I'm joined by Commissioner Liam Curran and Commissioner Kiana Saxon. Thank you. Uh, please ensure that your audio and visuals are working properly. I will call each item in the order that it appears on this morning's agenda. I will then ask who is present on behalf of the licensee, who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department, and whether there are any other individuals with firsthand knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify. I will then swear in all parties, after which the police report will be read into the record. The licensee or their representative will then have the opportunity to make a brief statement, followed by questions by the chair and commissioners. Again, all testimony will be limited only to those individuals with firsthand personal knowledge of the alleged incident. We'll begin with item number one on this morning's agenda, calling Galway Inc. doing business as the Harp, located at 85 Causeway Street, date of the incident, January 14th, 2022, assault and battery, patron on patron, in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Chapter 265, Section 13A. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Attorney Ryan Gazda on behalf of the licensee. With me this morning is Jamie Roberts, who is the general manager. Thank you. And who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Detective Juban, uh, Officer Lucas was, uh, was summoned, but Officer Lucas was involved in a, a motor vehicle accident and uh, is not present. And um, where Detective Juba is. So, Lieutenant Detective Troy, if I could. Thank you, Lieutenant Troy. Are there any other individuals with firsthand knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify? Okay, could you all please raise your right hand? Do you, sir, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Troy, you may please proceed with the police report. Uh, reading from the police report, all of it by. Uh, Police Officer Edward Lucas on January 15, 2022. Uh, it states as follows At 1145 on Friday, January 14, 2022, Officers Lucas and Giblin and the Alpha 103 responded to a radio call for an assault and battery at the Harp, 85 Causeway Street, Boston. On arrivals, officers were directed by Harp staff uh, members to Porter's Bar on Portland Street. The staff members indicated that a man in a red vest and the unknown suspect in a in a backwards hat, entered the bar after uh, committing an assault inside the harp. Officers went to Porter's and were able to speak with the witness, Steve George, who was uh, wearing a red vest. George stated that while in the harp, a male su suspect, later identified as uh, Chris Janus Uli, grabbed George's wife's buttocks. George stated that a verbal uh, altercation occurred, but he denied assaulting anyone. George stated that the victim, Uli, own friend assaulted him due to his uh, actions. Officers were unable to make contact with anybody uh, wearing a backwards hat. Officers spoke to a second witness, Haley George, who confirmed that she was touched inappropriately and that her husband did not assault anybody. Officers went to the harp and spoke to Uli, who was still in the, in the back of Boston EMS ambulance. Uli said, stated that after going to the bathroom, he returned to the area of the bar where his friends were located. On arrival, Uli stated that 
Uh, George yelled at him and told him to stay away. During the verbal altercation, Uli said he was headbutted by another unknown male. Uli had a laceration to the bridge of his nose with swelling. Boston EMS transported uh, Mr. Uli to Mass General Hospital. Officers also spoke with HARP staff who showed video footage of the incident. Officers were able to see that George was in the video verbally arguing with Uli. During the uh, altercation, Uli was headbutted by an unknown suspect. George was not observed in the video committing an assault. Uh, Sergeant Whiteman was uh, um, surprised at the incident and Detective Juba um, issued a license premise violation. That's the extent of the uh, incident with George. Thank you. Attorney Gosser, would you like to address the alleged incident? Uh, yes, just a few questions for the detective, if I might. Um, I, I believe you were not present um, on, on site that evening, but to the extent that the police report um, recites that the licensee was cooperative with officers when they were on site. Um, there's nothing to indicate that they weren't. And would it be fair to say that the licensee, in fact, assisted the officers in terms of providing video surveillance and assisting in terms of providing background information where the suspects and victim might have gone after the incident to the officers? Yeah, it states quite clearly here that they directed the officers to Portland Bar. Thank you. I have nothing further for the detective. A um, few questions for the manager, if he's still on with us. I'm here. Your your name for the record? James Roberts, general manager of the HARP. And you have knowledge of the incidents on January 14th? I was working that night, yes. Can you just briefly describe, to the best of your knowledge, what happened that night? Sure. Uh, I mean, the police report pretty much describes it, but we, uh, one of my managers, uh, Mitch Sopp, observed a gentleman with a bloody nose, uh, brought him downstairs for uh, medical attention. Uh, we asked him what happened. We went back to the office. We watched the video. Uh, we saw the headbutton incident. We immediately called the police uh, and said there was an assault uh, at the harp. We kept an eye on the people. We didn't want to, you know, restrain them, hope, uh, thinking they'd take off. So we just kind of kept an eye on them. They walked out of the, uh, the harp, went down to Porter's Bar and Grill. When the police arrived, uh, we told them what happened. We directed them to Porter's Bar and Grill. They went in. They had their interview with, uh, with the person we pointed out. Then they came back, we showed them the video. Uh, they talked to the victim who was in the back of the ambulance and uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I, we, so. I, I believe you said, but it was in fact the licensee who called the police to the premise, correct? Yes, I called the police personally. Thank you. I have nothing further. I would just state for the board that the licensee followed their internal protocol to a T. Once they noticed that this had occurred, they contacted the police were cooperative with the officers and showed the video surveillance of the incident. Um, they preserved that video surveillance and we would be happy to provide it to the board to the extent that that might be helpful. Um, or of course, happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Thank you. We'll turn to the board to see if there are any questions. Uh, beginning with Chairman Joyce, any questions? Thank you, Attorney Gazda. If you could share that video with the board, um, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I don't have any other questions at this time. Commissioner Carter, Commissioner Saxon, any questions for the licensee? I do not, thank you. None from me, thank you. Thank you, and the board will take this matter under advisement. Uh, please do provide any video to licensing board at boston.gov. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. Calling item number two, Old Colonial Corporation doing business as Bell in Hand, located at 45 to 55 Union Street. Date of the incident, March 11th, 2022, patron on patron assault and battery in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Chapter 265, Section 13A. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Uh, Trish Malone representing the O'Connell Corporation doing business as the bell in hand. Thank you, Attorney Malone. Um, who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? <clears throat> Officer Michael Hilton in. Sergeant Daniel McIsaac. Thank you. And are there any other individuals with firsthand knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify this morning? Thank you. Attorney Mullen, will you be calling any witnesses? Uh, yes, there should be um, Mr. Uh, Herrera's in the room and Mr. Hutchins and also um, Adam Kessler. Yes, Hector. 
support us here, General Manager. Uh, Mr. Kessler, are you here? Adam Kessler. Yeah, I see him as well. Adam Kessler. And Mr. Hodg Hodgins? Yep, that was there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hudgens, is it possible to turn your camera on so we can swear you in? Yep. Thank you. And Mr. Huertas as well. Looks like your camera has turned off. Thank you. Okay, everyone who is going to testify, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Uh, Officer Hilton, will you be reading the police report? Yes, sir, I will. Great, thank you. You may proceed. About 10.40 p.m. on Wednesday, March 11, 2022, Officers Hilton in and Marsh and the Alpha 103 Frank responded to a radio call for assault and battery in progress at the Bell & Hand Tavern, 45 Union Street, downtown Boston. Also assisting on scene was the Alpha K-1, Gorman, McGann, Alpha 202, Florentino, Pritchard, Zulio, and Alpha 421, Merricks. Upon arrival, officers observed the male face down on the sidewalk next to the Bell and Hand Tavern on, Han on the Hanover Street side of the bar. The male was observed with a reddish brown liquid believed to be blood pooling under his face. The male was later identified as John Montesanto. At that time, officers requested EMS for an evaluation. When officers sat Montesanto up, they observed Montesanto with a large amount of reddish brown substance believed to be blood on his face and hands. Officers asked Monsanto what happened, to which he stated that a fight broke out on the second floor bathroom and that he got, quote, beat up. Monsanto told officers that he was using the urinal when he heard what he believed to be a fight breaking out. And when he turned around, he could not recall what happened, but knew he got beat up. Officers observed a severe laceration on the upper part of the victim's left cheek, as well as severe swelling to the area of his face. At that time, Boston EMS arrived on scene, Ambulance 1, and evaluated Montesanto. To the extent of the laceration and, swollenness, and swollenness of Montesanto's face, he was placed in the neck collar and transported to Mass General Hospital for further evaluation. While the victim was being evaluated by Boston EMS, officers went up to the second floor bathroom where they observed large quantities of reddish brown substance believed to be blood on the bathroom floor, door, and hallway Door and hallway door leading to the Hanover Street exit. Due to the extent of the injuries to the victim and quantity of blood on the floor in the bathroom, officers requested detectives to respond to the scene. Officers then spoke with two witnesses, Trevor Credit and Emin Gibbons, who both stated that the suspect came into the bathroom and was immediately confrontational with multiple people inside the bathroom, swearing and yelling the words, faggot. Shortly after, a fight ensued during which Montesanto and the suspect had to be pulled apart. After being pulled apart, the suspect left the bathroom and fled the scene in an unknown direction. Credit and Gibbons both described the suspect as a white male in his 20s or 30s wearing a white shirt and backwards hat. Alpha Detectives Alpha 803 Megan Walsh and Alpha 810 Mark Walsh arrived to process the tour. Detectives spoke with the owner of the Bell and Hand, Adam Kessler, to look at, a, at camera security footage of the hallway outside the bathroom on the second floor. Kessler then sent a copy of the footage to Alpha 803 for further review. Uh, due to the incident happening inside the Bell & Hand, officers requested the patrol supervisor, the Alpha 914, Sergeant McIsaac, to conduct a Code 35 license premise inspection, citation number 026609. Officers' body-worn cameras were activated during this incident. Thank you, officer. Uh, Attorney Malone, would you like to address the alleged incident? Yes, um, Officer Hilton, when you arrived, was there anybody from the staff that actually um, was um, beside Mr. Montesano? Uh, I believe at that time, one of the bouncers were. Okay, so you didn't just drive up and see a man laying on the ground with nobody not knowing where this gentleman came from. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay. And so um, when you were waiting to see um, the, or calling the EMS, um, you had an opportunity to speak to Mr. Santo, Montesanto, and he appeared to give you a story that he has no idea really what happened um, other than he went to the second floor bathroom, was assaulted. He didn't see who hit him. And it, it, it seemed to be an altercation that was random. Would that be correct to say? I 
I would say he did have a hard time recalling the events that occurred that took place in the bathroom. <laughs> okay. And um, when, who made you aware that there were two other witnesses, Mr. Gibbons and Mr. Um, Credit, that actually um, were on the premises, um, which you sp subsequently spoke with? I believe they, I believe they approached us while we were inside the, uh, while we were upstairs. <laughs> okay. And was their testimony almost similar to what Mr. Santo had described to you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So in your opinion, um, did the licensee cooperate with you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Would you say that in your opinion, this was a random altercation that happened on the license premises? Yes. So therefore, if it was a random altercation, was there anything that the licensee could have done differently that would have stopped this incident from happening on the license premise? I'm, I don't believe so. <laughs> okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Millen. Um, did you want to present any of your witnesses or was that? Yes. I would like to speak to um, Hector Loretez, please. Absolutely. Here. Okay. Mr. Rates, when did you become um, aware of what was happening in the second floor bathroom? Um, I was notified by the um, one of our managers, Dallas Hudgens, um, that there were the, he was notified that someone was bleeding in the restroom. Um, I was notified then immediately. Okay. And what is the procedure when, in fact, there is an altercation on the premise? I'd call 911 um, and ask for police presence. Okay. okay. While you were calling 911, was anyone escorting the alleged victim out of the licensed premises to wait for the Boston Police Department? Correct. Yes, uh, Dallas Hudgens was. Okay. And did you make it known to the Boston Police that you believed that um, the um, there was in fact a surveillance camera on that um, level? Yes. Okay. And did you also make them aware that there may have been two other um, witnesses? Um, to the event that they um, may have had a cell phone or some other video surveillance or just video that may have been made of this random fight? Correct. Yes, I did. Okay. And to your knowledge, was that also given to the Boston Police Department? Uh, yes, I had um, gone downstairs when they were watching video footage and um, gave that to them when um, I spoke to customers that said they had it. Okay, so the Boston police have both the surveillance video from the licensed premise as well as some cell phone coverage of what in fact happened in the second floor bathroom. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so since this incident has happened, have you put in any procedures, um, any implementation of anything? Um, because the, I have reviewed the, the tape and it looks like you can only see like the, the back end of somebody going down the hallway, which really, you, you can't get that much from from the video. So is that something that you have implemented, um, recognizing um, how you need to be a little bit more proactive and actually seeing the face of the person should there be a licensed premise incident on the premise? Correct, yes. We've uh, switched our procedures um, for that particular door staff. Um, they are now standing in that back hallway there instead of the front of the hallway, um, as well as we have a second door guy or manager walking around and checking the front of the hallway every 10 minutes. Okay. Um, members of the board, I have nothing further. Thank you. Chairman Joyce, do you have any questions? Yes. <clears throat> um, Attorney Malone, are you saying that it was Hector Huertas who called the police? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, how many security officers were working that night? Mr. Huertas? We had uh, 15 door staff members working that night. Okay, and what are your procedures to monitor bathrooms? Um, as stated, we have a, now we have, beforehand it was, they were standing in the front hallway there um, of, the, of the hallway. Now we have one standing in the back hallway um, at all times, as well as a manager or another door staff member walking up every 10 to 15 minutes to check that front area, um, as well as to knock on the women's restroom to make sure everyone's okay. As, and we do have a female um, manager as well who does check inside that restroom. So on this night, you had one person standing at the front of the hallway? Correct. Okay. And that person was unaware that 
a fight occurred inside the bathroom? Correct. That resulted in someone in a pool of blood? They didn't hear anything? They didn't see anything? Um, not until they got, um, not until a customer let them know that there was someone bleeding in the restroom. Okay, and, and at what point did the suspect flee? Um, I'm not sure. I believe the camera footage shows that. Okay. Madam Director, would it be appropriate to, for actually for you to see the, the surveillance um, that was given to the Boston Police Department? Would that be helpful to you? Yes. Okay. Mr. Castle, uh, can you please get that to her? Yes. Okay. Do you know how long the person, how long the fight lasted in the bathroom? Um, I believe it was 30 to 45 seconds. Okay, um, I have no further questions. Commissioner Curran or Commissioner Saxon, do you? Uh, do you guys have the customer cell phone video as well? Yes. We okay. do have one. And you've observed that? Correct. And what did, what did that capture? Um, all, I believe from all I've seen on that video was that the, um, alleged, the, the victim was throwing a punch at the end. That's all you see in the video. Um, that and then a brief um, shot of the suspect. Okay, so the, the video started at some point it, it, during the altercation. Correct. That's all I have, thank you. Also, can we, can we get that video as well when you send over the other video? Yes. There's no sound in the um, in the surveillance video, correct? I'm just trying to get at like why the um, the bouncer just didn't hear anything in the bathroom. Is it was it very particularly loud in that night? Yes. Um, so upstairs is the the dance floor. Um, he, like I said uh, prior to, he was standing on the front end of the hallway. Um, where the music is playing. Um, since then, we have sent them to the, the back exit of the hallway. So they're on camera as well as able to see and hear into the bathroom. <laughs> Any further questions from the board? Okay. Thank you. The board will take this matter under advisement as well. And Attorney Malone, you can submit any videos to licensing board at boston.gov. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Item number three has been continued at the request of the licensee and will be uh, rescheduled for the next available hearing date. Now calling item number four, Villa Francesca's Inc. doing business as Francesca's located at 150 Richmond Street, date of the incident, April 1st, 2022, indecent assault and battery employee on patron in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, who is present on behalf of the licensee. Good morning. Uh Mr. Secretary, uh, Stephen Miller, McDermott, Quilty and Miller. Uh, I have with me Tomas Salmaron and his wife, Arlinda Salmaron. And I apologize, the, um, our internet is down in our office, so I'm doing this on our phone. So it might be a little, um, little squirrely, I guess. So far we can see and hear you just fine. Uh, Thank you. Who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Sergeant Detective McKinnon. Thank you. And are there any uh, other individuals with firsthand knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify this morning? Can you all please My, raise your hand. Oh. Yeah, all right. You need to raise your hand. Yes, you all yes. please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. I do. Thank you. Sergeant Detective McKenna, uh, you can please proceed with the police report. Thank you. On April 1st, 2022, Officer O'Donnell will assign to the front desk at District 4, took a walk-in indecent assault and battery report from the victim, who was accompanied by her sister. The victim stated that she was at a restaurant located at 150 Richmond Street in Boston's North End named Restaurant de Villa Francesca. The two were at the location for approximately an hour and a half and were seated at the bar. 
While at the bar, a male who was described as in his 50s, olive complexion, medium build, and was wearing a Villa Francesca shirt was seated at the bar next to them. According to the victim and the witness, during this time, the suspect was believed to be named Thomas and may possibly be the owner of the business, spoke with the two while they were customers at, of the establishment. The victim had two drinks while at the location and stated that the suspect had spoken to the bartenders in Italian when they had ordered drinks. During the time that the victim, witness, and suspect were seated at the bar, the suspect put his arm around the victim as well as the witness several times. The victim stated that she did not want anyone to touch her younger sister. Uh, the suspect continued to speak with them and make flirtatious comments about them, to them about their looks. The suspects even pulled the victim's seat closer to her. The victim stated that the suspect put his hand and fondled, her and fondled the victim's breast and stated that he wanted to leave her with her. At, the at that time, the victim immediately left the restaurant. The two left the location and went to D4 to report the incident. Uh, Officer O'Donnell asked the victim if the, if the victim needed medical attention to which she declined. Um, SAU was notified of the incident. The victim was advised that SAU would be reaching out to, to them. Uh, the Delta 103, Herber and, and Canty drove the victim and witness back to her residence. Uh, that's the end of the police report. Thank I you did very reach much. out. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I did reach out to the victim. Um, I left a voicemail, briefly explained the hearing process and asked if she wanted to participate. Um, she did not get back to me. She has stated that she, she stated to the um, SAU detective that she did not want to pursue the matter in court. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, Attorney Miller, would you like to address the alleged incident? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Detective Sergeant, uh, you have no personal knowledge of this, correct? That is correct, sir. And, and Officer O'Donnell, who took the report, had no personal knowledge of this also, is that correct? That's correct. And, and Sergeant, uh, when you went to the premises, um, I believe you uh, met with uh, Erlinda Salmeron? Uh, yes, sir, that's correct. And was she cooperative? Yes, she was. Did you ask her any questions about the incident um, when you were there? I did not, no. Um, I have no further questions. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, I have uh, both Tomas Salmeron and his wife, Erlinda. Um, they own the restaurant. Tomas, uh, just by way of background, Tomas started working at Francesca's in 1992. As a busboy, since that time, he's been busboy, waiter, cook, um, manager, um, and now uh, owner, uh, along with his wife. His wife, Erlinda, um, started working at the restaurant in 1998. They both um, started at lower levels and have worked their way to uh, actual ownership of the restaurant. Um, in 30 years, there's never been a complaint against uh, Mr. Salmeron while he was working there and since he's been an owner. Um, the night in question, uh, and I'll, I'll, I just want to set the tone and then I'll uh, let uh, Mr. Salmeron and his wife speak. But on the night in question, it was a busy Friday night. Restaurant was full. They served well over 200 meals. Uh, Tomas was the both the manager, host, as well as um, assisting wait staff as a busboy and whatever else needed to be done. Uh, Erlinda was also working that night. She was uh, basically serving wine to tables, but she was also uh, in the different rooms uh, helping, uh, helping staff serve the customers. Just as uh, the layout of the restaurant 
is as you enter where Tomas would have been um, if he wasn't helping uh, seating people or assisting wait staff. As you walk in to the right of the uh, room, there's a 10 seat bar and to the left there's several tables where people dine. And then um, to the other, um, to the left also there's a dining room, uh, dining rooms, two dining rooms, smaller dining rooms that uh, with tables. Um, Tomas's wife was working that night also. Um, she was all through the restaurant and she was um, in and out of all the rooms. Um, and so uh, setting that tone since both of them were working, I'll, I'll just uh, ask Erlinda, I'm gonna ask Erlinda some questions and I'll have her try and get on the camera. So just please identify yourself to the, to the board. Yes, hi, my name is Erlinda. Erlinda Samaron? Erlinda Samaron, yes. And uh, were you in the restaurant that night? I was. Did you, um, you were in and out of all the rooms? Correct. Uh, yes. Busy night? Very busy night. Okay. Very busy night. Um, did you at any time, were you in and out of the room, the main room as I described where the bar was and tables? Many times. Yes. Many times, yes. all night. All night, yes. Did you ever see your husband sitting at the bar? No. Did he ever sit down that no. night? No. Um, did you ever see him sitting fraternizing with two women? No, sir. Um, how Would you have been a little unhappy if you saw him sitting while everybody else was working? Correct. Um, so you know nothing of this incident. You worked no. that night, you know nothing of this incident. Correct. Thank you. Um, would you want to ask her any questions now, or do you want to wait until Mr. Salmaron speaks? Oh, we can wait. You can proceed. Okay. Um, Tomas, please identify, identify yourself to the board. Uh, Thomas Salmaron. And um, were you working the night in question? Yes. What were your duties that night? I was uh, working at the front door. Um, so I'm a host sitting uh, customer and help them out the passport and in and out at the dining room. Okay, um, it's busy night. Yes, it was busy with the over 200 people, 200 cars. And the bar was busy. The bar was busy and there were over 200 meals served. Did you ever sit at the bar that night? No, I didn't. Did you ever sit down during the night? No. Um, do you know anything about the allegations in this incident? No. Um, I really have nothing else to add other than um, the, you know, both Mr. Salmaron and his wife were working that night. Um, it was a busy night, the thought that um, he would be sitting at the bar while the restaurant was packed and he was supposed to be the manager or host helping busboys or whatever and uh, sitting at the bar and, and uh, fraternizing uh, just doesn't make any sense. and, and uh, they're both per perplexed about the incident and really have no answer for, for what was filed. So I have nothing further. Thank you, Attorney Miller. Uh, Chairman Joyce, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions. Uh, Commissioner Curran, Commissioner Saxon, any questions? I do not. None for me. Thank you. Thank you. The board will take this matter under advisement as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Calling item number five, Highgate Hotels LP doing business as the Newberry Boston located at 15 Arlington Street. Date of the incident, March 23rd, 2022. Patron on patron threats in violation of Mass General Laws. Chapter 138, Section 64. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Hi, uh, once again, Good morning, Stephen Miller, uh, McDermott, Wilkie and Miller, uh, Mr. Executive Secretary, uh, Chairman and members of the board. Um, also with me this morning, although I can't tell from my phone, but I'm hoping that uh, uh, Kelsey Marie, uh, Jafar Gandhi um, 
and Jackie May, uh, and there may be uh, Robert Roulard, there may be others from uh, the hotel staff on with me this morning. Great. Yes, I see them. Yep, we see, we do see them indeed. Who is present on behalf of the Boston Police? Hi, sir. Good morning, Officer Jacobs. Thank you, Officer Jacobs. Are there any other individuals with firsthand knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify this morning? Great. Could all who plan to testify please raise your right hand? Sir, Sergeant Salucci. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you. Could all please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes, sir. I do. Thank you. Officer Jacobs, will you be reading the police report? I am, sir. Great. Thank you. You may proceed. About 10.25 p.m. on Wednesday, March 23rd, 2002, Officer Jacobs and May in the Delta 105 Frank responded to a radio call for assault and battery in progress at 1 Newberry Street, Boston, Mass. Upon arrival, officers, officers spoke with the suspect slash caller number one, James Robert O'Neill, who stated he called the police because he was assaulted at the bar, Contessa. The suspect O'Neill reported to officers he was making his way back to the bar when he was pushed. The suspect stated he had been at the bar for three hours before the incident occurred. Officer spoke with the victim, Tambo Barrow, who stated the suspect was making derogatory comments to his wife, Venus Barbosa. The suspect stated, let me take you for an hour. The victim advised the suspect to stop. The suspect then stated, I have a gun and I got security outside. The suspect was asked to leave by staff prior to officer's arrival and refused. Officers Pat Frisk, the suspect to no avail. Officers removed the suspect and escorted him back to his hotel room in the same building. Um, all parties involved were heavily intoxicated. Sergeant Salute to the Delta 903 notif was notified and a code 35 was conducted. Um, and then we have a second police report from that night as well. Mm -hmm. um, at about 11.30 uh, p.m. on Wednesday, officers Jacobs and May in the Delta 105 responded back to one Newberry Street, Boston, Mass. Hotel manager Jackie May requested to have the suspect, James Robert O'Neill, removed from the premise after officers had left the scene. Officers with Sergeant Salucci, the Delta 903, were escorted up to the room um, with the hotel manager. Officers told the suspect he was no longer welcome on the premise due to threatening comments he had made earlier in Contessa to other patrons. It should be noted that while packing his belongings, the suspect made comments such as, I own guns when I was threatened, I could shoot them a thousand yards away because I was in the military. The suspect packed his belongings and was escorted off the premise. License pre premise violation 042230 was issued by Sergeant Salucci. Thank you. And we, I believe we have one other supplemental. I don't know if um, you have that as well. Do I do not. I just have that for supplemental. Um, I, I can pull up that supplemental if you'd like it. Yes, yes please. Uh, I have a copy here. If Thank you, sir. Um, just reading from a report authored by Sergeant Salucci. On March 23rd, 2022, a Code 35 was conducted at Queen Newbury Street Contessa Restaurant um, after officers received a call for an intoxicated male later identified as James Robert O'Neill, who had made threats to shoot another patron of Contessa Restaurant. The male was also a guest at Newbury Hotel, when Newbury Street was to join the premises. While officers originally responded to the location, the decision was made to allow uh, James Robert O'Neill to stay at the stay the evening at the hotel, but leave the restaurant. On further investigation, forthcoming information regarding the threat management at the hotel, Jackie Mee was uncomfortable with the patron remaining for the evening and requested the officers to assist in having O'Neill uh, leave the premises for the evening. While conducting a Code 35 license premise inspection of the contested restaurant, <clears throat> manager Jaffa Gadi stated that uh, permits to the restaurant were not located within Contessa restaurant, we were downstairs as the establishment was part of the hotel. Gandhi then brought, the, uh, brought Sergeant Salucci to the basement of the hotel where two per permits were affixed to the wall near the restrooms. Two permits were ready available, uh, an in-holder license and an entertainment license. Sergeant Salucci acquired about the other permits, which is a fire assembly permit. She was directed to the front, front office manager of uh, Newbury Hotel, Jackie Mee, who could not locate any further uh, permits. At that time, Sergeant Salucci, 
so that you both manage to uh, inform the license premise violation will be issued. Contestant restaurant manager uh, Candy acknowledged the sign for the license premise violations. Both managers were respectful and cooperative through the entire process. That's the extent of the report. Thank you very much. Attorney Miller, would you like to address the alleged incident? Um, yes, uh, Officer Jacobs, um, when you arrived at the premises, um, the the staff of the hotel had um, had they escorted him out of the restaurant at that time? Was he outside the restaurant in the hallway when you arrived? I'm not sure if it's still if it counts as part of the restaurant or, but it was in the lobby by the hostess area of the restaurant. So he was still in the top floor where Contessa is. Yeah, uh, that's right. I'm, I'm sorry that. Uh, so he was in the lobby and management staff was there along with security. Yes, that is correct. And then um, they relied on um, your, uh, you and, and officer May to assist them with this, with this uh, individual. Yes, there's um, many other officers arrived on scene once the threat of the gun was found out. And, uh, originally, did, did you um, and, and any of the other officers, were you part of the officers that escorted him back to his room? I was, yes. Um, how would you describe this individual? Um, was he um, loud and obnoxious? He was, and he was very intoxicated throughout the whole process, not making much speech, and was very um, condescending to the officers. Was he making um, any threats? He was, yes. Was he making any racist comments? I, I do not recall. Okay. Um, did the hotel staff uh, cooperate with you during this whole incident? Yes, they did. Um, I have nothing further for uh, Officer Jacobs. Um, Sergeant Salucci, are you still there? Yes, sir. And um, when um, you heard my questions to Officer Jacobs, would you um, also confirm that the hotel staff was involved uh, when the police arrived and, and throughout the whole incident to assist um, as best they could. I can't speak up on behalf of the original call because I wasn't there at the first time I was called back um, after the fact, so. And, and you you were called when, when the, the, the decision was made to ask him to leave the hotel? Yes, sir. And at that time, once again, he was making threats the threats had already been um established prior to that okay um was was the staff cooperative with you yes sir uh thank you sergeant i have no further questions um kelsey are you there um, i am yeah uh, could you identify, identify yourself to the, Sorry, to the board? Sorry, I'm trying to fix my camera. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelsey McKinnon. I'm a bartender and, here. I served on that evening. And um, did you uh, request um, assistance with, as, as part of the protocol where uh, at this time uh, this this particular patron, he had been in the restaurant for some time and he had uh, uh, drinks and dinner. Yes, he had a, a pretty good sized meal. He was here for a little bit. He wasn't drinking too aggressively. It was um, probably about like one drink or so every hour. It was um, pretty slow paced. It wasn't anything aggressive. And, and um, at some point you made a decision that uh, for him, it was time to go. Uh, yes, he um, made some comments to a young woman 
um, who was here with her fiance and she told her fiance and he then went up to the gentleman and asked, why would he do that? And then the, um, the gentleman in question, he got very loud, very aggressive. So at that point I had my co-bartender leave and go get my manager. Um, then the gentleman started talking about how he had guns and that he was staying in the hotel and that he um, pretty much had like a bullet for everyone in here. And he was just saying like really crazy things. So I went into the kitchen to ask for like any like chefs to come out because just, you know, like more uh, like male bodies. I don't know, maybe it would be a little bit better than to handle the situation or be around for just in case. Hey, and at that time, um... The manager Jafar Gandhi show up. Gandhi showed up. Yeah, very quickly. And and um, in a matter of less than a minute, I would is would that yeah. be correct? Yeah. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Gandhi um, then took control of as the manager took control of the of the situation. Yes. Jafar, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, so you heard what uh, Kelsey said. Um, she, this uh, looked like an incident starting to occur based on the comments that Mr. O'Neill made. Um, you got there and, and separated the two? Correct. Uh, my bartender approached me to the table where I was like dealing with another situation. And I, I turned at him and I asked him if it was urgent, which he replied with the affirmative. So we made our way quickly back to the bar. He explained briefly the situation on the way that there was like an altercation, a verbal altercation that is getting very heated at the bar and that we needed to, to separate like two gentlemen. So I got in there. Uh, the gentleman in question was very loud and he has been noticed throughout the evening for being like pretty loud and obnoxious and being a little disrupt disruptive to the other guests experience. Not to the extent we would have asked him to leave prior to this, but uh, we had we could, we had knowledge of um, a prior not great behavior. Let's put that that way. So when I arrived on the scene, um, the two gentlemen were very close to each other's faces and getting very loud. So I got in between them and tried to separate them. I addressed directly the gentleman um, uh, in question, O'Neill, and asked him to leave separate times. Uh, he refused to indulge. I threatened to call hotel security. He still refused to, to cooperate. Uh, I then made a call to hotel security that joined us like a few minutes afterwards. Um, we then escorted him to the lobby area and right next to the elevators. And all of a sudden he, he made a stop and said, well, I can call the police, the police myself as well. So he pulled his phone, uh, his phone out, and called nine one one. All right. Um, so at, at that point, at that point, um, he called nine one one. Your intent was to escort him back to his room. My intent was just to escort him off the premises. I did not know. I was not sure if he was a customer of the hotel or not at that point. Okay. Um, so you were going to escort him off the premises. He called the police. And at that point, the police took over? Uh, yes, they made their way in a few minutes later. And during his call, I could hear him with the operator. Like the, the reason for his call was that he was being assaulted by numerous black individuals because, quote unquote, they may have not liked the color of his skin. Um, I heard more clarification from his end, assuming that the operator was actually asking questions to make sure that like what was happening um that's pretty much it then the police made their way a few minutes later and after explaining what had happened they took matter into their hands and you you never questioned the you suspect etc jafar you never witnessed any assault correct no uh, no other than, assault other, than, other than a verbal altercation that's correct okay um uh Jackie May, are you there? Yeah, I'm oh, yeah. um, Could you identify yourself to the board, please? Um, Jackie May, representing the Newbury Hotel as the manager on duty during the night of that incident. And so you came on 
you came on the premises at 11 o'clock? Yes, I arrived at 11 for my overnight shift. Um, I did notice a cruiser outside the building upon entry. So I inquired about the situation with the previous manager where I was handed up, hand, uh, received the pass on from them. I uh, then noticed later in the, about 10 minutes or so, I noticed officers with Jafar in the lobby of the hotel, which is in the lower level. Um, I was asked about our location of our licenses. That's when I escorted uh, the two down to our lower level bar. Uh, we did have two licenses available at the time. Um, the fire license was not available at the time. So I made a call to our director of engineering. She informed us that there was a copy of it in her office. So I've asked the previous manager to retrieve it. Uh, while he was looking for the license, um, the officers did ask if I was comfortable with the, the guests remaining on the property. Um, when I was made fully aware of it and thought about it, I just didn't think it was safe for any other guests or staff members, just for the comments that he made. So I ultimately, I decided to have him removed from the property. Um, so we did go up to the room to evict him. Um, when, the, when we came back down to the lobby, the guests came, well, was still making threats, um, threatening, not physical threats, but threats of opening the hotel, suing the hotel and the, and the restaurant. Um, as he was loud in the lobby, officers escorted him off the property. Uh, the second manager did retrieve the fire code license, but uh, unfortunately, officers never returned to collect it. Right. So, since that time, the licenses are posted throughout the um, hotel, including the restaurant upstairs and the rest of the bar downstairs, et cetera. All the licenses are properly posted. Correct. That is correct. Um, so I, I imagine the board might have some questions. Thank you, Attorney Miller. Chairman Joyce, do you have any questions? Thank you. You just answered one of my questions regarding where the licenses are, but could you put together a timeline for me? What time did he leave Contessa and what time um, did he, was he removed? It sounds like he was removed at 1130 from the hotel. Um, I think my, my understanding is that uh, this all happened fairly quickly as far as um, the officers were there at uh, 1025 and um, or they received the call at 1025. They, they um, took control of the situation. The, uh, when Mr. May came on um, at uh, a little after 11 and found out about the uh, the threats that were made that uh, he made the decision to ask the officers to remove him from the hotel. Um, based on what Mr. May said, um, he took a, a very long time to pack up his belongings and was constantly making threats, I guess, about uh, or making comments about uh, his military and shooting people at a thousand yards away and then suing the hotel and he was gonna fire everybody, et cetera. So um, I think the whole thing started around 10.30 and, and he was off the premises. Okay. I think around 11.30. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I don't have any further questions. Commissioner Curran or Commissioner Saxon? I don't have any questions, thank you. Nothing from me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Calling item number six, Venture 66 LLC doing business as Halftime Pizza, located at 115 Causeway Street, date of the incident, June 10th, 2022. Overcrowding, 238 mechanical count, capacity 145, in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Boards Rule 1.03J and 1.06A and F and no entertainment license posted. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? My name is uh, Attorney Thomas Amoroso. And here with me is Justino Pasquale and Santino Barrasso. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, I'm using my daughter's computer because my computer wasn't working this morning. So you'll see the name Taylor Amoroso. My first name is actually Thomas. 
Thank you. And who is present on behalf of the Boston Police? I will be. Captain Hernandez, thank you. And are there any other individuals with firsthand knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify this morning? I'd check to William Gallagher if need be. Thank you. Uh, can you all please raise your right hand? Thank you. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Detective Hernandez, please proceed with the police report. I'm sorry, sir. I have two in front of me. Which one are we doing? Yep. Uh, we're starting with uh, violation 043139. June 10th. June 10th, yes. Um, on uh, 6 10 2022, at about uh, 11 p.m., Sergeant Detective William Gallagher and Detective Eddie Hernandez signed to the license premise unit, conducted a license premise inspection of Halftime Pizza located at 115 Causeway Street. As detectives approached the premise, they observed the inside of Halftime Pizza to be crowded. Detectives inquired with the staff member at the door as to the count inside. The staff member said that he did not have a count. Thinking that the premise had exceeded its occupant load, Detective Hernandez conducted a mechanical count, which resulted in 238 persons being found inside. The premise capacity is listed at 145. Detectives instructed staff not to let anyone, in, anyone inside and station someone at the door, side door. Um, staff, uh, staff spoke with the person in charge, Justino Pasquale informed him of the finding. In addition, detectives were able Unable to locate a current entertainment license as a result of uh, what was observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued license premise inspection notice 043139 to Halftime Pizza for overcrowding 238 patrons found on the mechanical count, capacity 145, no entertainment license posted. Mr. Decino Pasquale signed for an accepted notice. That is all. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Amoroso, would you like to address the alleged incident? Um, yes, yeah, so th there's really no contesting the fact that they were overcrowded. Um, Justino and Santino uh, recently opened Halftime Pizza. As you probably know, Halftime Pizza was in business for a long time. They shut down for a couple of years because of COVID. Justino and Santino opened in January of 2022. This was a Celtics playoff game. It was in the finals. Um, it got really busy. It got really crowded uh, due to their inexperience. They didn't handle the situation properly. Um, there were previous Celtics games and previous Bruins games uh, where things went more smoothly, but this particular game, um, unfortunately, things got uh, worse than they should have been. They have requested that the uh, capacity be enlarged. Uh, at the time of this incident, they had some paperwork at 1010 Mass Ave and I believe in, at Boston City Hall to get a license for 188 people. They've since had architects drawings uh, increase that and they're requesting uh, capacity to be increased to 222. Those are pending before the proper authorities. Um, so again, there's not, um, uh, other than their inexperience, there's not really an excuse for uh, allowing that many people in the premises. Again, they're new business owners. They haven't had many, if any, violations that I'm aware of, other than the two that we have for today. So I'd ask you to take that in consideration when deciding what to do. Thank you. Chairman Joyce, do you have any questions or would you like to take the other violation into account as well? No, I have some questions. Who is the manager of record? Santino. Um, I think it's both Justino's a manager and um, Santino. I think they're both listed as managers, but if I'm wrong about that. No, there's one manager of record that when this would have been transferred, we would have sworn him in as the manager of record for this license. Okay, can you- I would have asked you that? four questions. Was, I think it's Justino. It is. It is me, yeah. So I want to make it clear that when we approve a manager of record for an alcohol license, we ask if you understand the rules and regulations of this board, the ABCC, and the laws of the Commonwealth as they pertain to the sale and service of alcohol. I'm going to ask you again, do you understand those rules? I do. Okay. 
So a Celtics playoff game is not an unexpected event. What was your staffing that night? I had my full staff. Um, How present. many people is that? 15 people on a game night. Okay. Um, why wasn't there anyone at the door doing the count? Uh, we had someone at the door. He just, you know, we had a back door and a front door. He just didn't have his um, an accurate count. Do you see um, why this is a public safety issue? Of course, I do. Okay. So do you want to explain for the board how you understand what your responsibility is to prevent overcrowding like this, despite the fact you know, that it's God. a Celtics playoff game? Because we don't take that into consideration. For sure. I mean, God forbid any fire or anything. I mean, you know, a back way in the place, you know, obviously, you know, more than the you know, place is capable of uh, having capacity, you know. Um, that's just a safety hazard for everyone trying to exit the building. You're located across from TV Garden. It's not unusual that there are sports games going on, concerts going on. Correct. How um, often do you have someone at the door? Every game, a game event, we have someone at the door. Okay. You know, especially with walking out with alcohol and, you know, just making sure the, you know, the door is not being blocked for any, um, you know, any incident. Okay. So I, I suggest that you familiarize yourself again with the rules and regulations of this board, the ABCC and the laws of the Commonwealth as they pertain to the sale and service of alcohol. These are very serious violations. Um, Detective Hernandez, were they cooperative? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Commissioner Curran or Commissioner Saxon? Nothing further for me, thank you. I don't have any questions, thank you. Thank you. Board will take this matter under advisement. We'll now read into the record item number seven, which is the same licensee, Venture 66 LLC, doing business as Halftime Pizza, located at 115 Causeway Street. Date of this incident was June 16th, 2022. Premise allowing uh, permission, I believe that should say admission after third quarter in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64. Gambling taking place on premise in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64 and overcrowding, 202 mechanical count, 145 capacity in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Boards Rule 1.03J and 1.06A and F. Um, it was present on behalf of the licensee. This is Attorney Thomas Amoroso. Okay. And on this violation, who is present on behalf of the Boston Police? Detective William Gallagher. Detective Hernandez, if needed. Thank you. And are there any other individuals with firsthand knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify this morning? Uh, you have all been sworn in. Uh, Sergeant Detective Gallagher, you may please proceed with the police report. Uh, yes, good morning. I'll be reading from the uh, Boston Police Incident Report that I wrote on 6-16-2022 at 10.56 p.m. Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Detective Eddie Hernandez of the Licensed Premise Unit were in the North Station area monitoring the bars and restaurants during the Celtics Warrior Championship basketball game. Premises in the Bullfinch Triangle were directed prior to the game that all premises must cease admitting patrons at the beginning of the third period, and there will be no lines after that. As detectives made their way up Causeway Street, they observed the front door to halftime pizza to be wide open with patrons freely entering the establishment. The Celtics game at this point was in the fourth. Detectives stepped through the open door and immediately observed several males standing by one male with a board containing three half circle shaped shells. Detectives observed that male place a small object under the shell, then move the shells in a circular fashion on the board. A second male then pointed to a shell which was moved to show it was empty. The second male then gave $20 to the first male. Detectives observed a third man who stated he was an employee watching the action. Detectives informed him that there is no gambling to be conducted inside the premise. The employee stated he did not think that they were exchanging money. The meals were then removed from the premise. Detectives informed the doorman to close the doors per Boston Licensing Board guidelines for game six, and the employee stated that he was ordered to keep them open by the building owner. Detectives then closed the doors and directed no further admission. Detectives observed the premise to again be quite crowded with many patrons standing around watching the game and drinking. 
thinking the premise was overcrowded, Detective Hernandez conducted a mechanical count, which resulted in 202 patients. The premise capacity is set at 145. The doorman informed detectives that he believed that he had more than 150 inside, but did not have a count for detectives. Detectives sought out the manager, Santina Luigi Caruso, who was across the street. Within several minutes, Mr. Caruso was present. Sergeant Gallagher reiterated, reiterated the Boston Licensing Board guidelines that were sent to his premise. Sergeant Gallagher was given two responses, one that we did not get it, and two that we were told by the building owner to keep the premise open no matter what the Boston police said. That time, the doorman appeared and informed Mr. Caruso that he could not keep people from entering the premise and that he was being threatened with physical violence. Observing that the premise was out of control, overcrowded, and unable to keep people out, Sergeant Detective Gallagher called Captain Chicolo and apprised him of the situation. At that time, Captain Chicolo ordered the premise closed in the name of public safety. A squad of officers arrived shortly thereafter and began clearing the premise, with some rambunctious, intoxicated males being escorted off property. Sergeant Gallagher was able to speak to the building owner over the phone and inform him of the closure. Sergeant Detective Gallagher had to terminate the call after several minutes due to the respectful and vulgar tone of the person on the other end. As a result, what was observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued license premise inspection notice number 043146, the half time pizza for a premise allowing admission after third quarter in violation of Boston licensing board guidelines of Celtic game six, gambling taking place on premise, overcrowding 202 mechanical count, capacity 145, no house count, Mr. Santina Luigi Caruso signed for and accepted the notice. So those essentially are the facts of that evening. Thank you very much. Um, Attorney Amoroso, would you like to address the alleged incident? Uh, yes, if I could. So again, I would reiterate the inexperience of these two young men in um, operating this restaurant. However, just so you know, Mr. Uh, Pasquale was not at the premises that night because he was sick. Uh, again, it was a um, Celtics game, big crowd. And as you said, Commissioner should be expected to get a big crowd. However, in speaking with Mr. Uh, Barrasso and Mr. Pasquale, they said they never got notice of the third period uh, restriction that the city imposed on that. And uh, they said they checked their emails, several emails, they never got anything. So um, they, they, they said they weren't aware of that particular uh, requirement. However, doesn't excuse the overcrowding. Um, regarding the gambling, um, Mr. Barrasso, who was the manager on duty that night, didn't see that taking place. Um, I know the officer said an employee saw it and didn't realize that people were passing money. Uh, so uh, they've learned a valuable lesson from these two incidents. Uh, they've told me they're going to put different uh, procedures in place going forward. They're going to hire more people for these big events and make sure that they're um, <clears throat> watching everything more closely. And um, they, they, they want me to tell you that they would assure the um, commission that uh, these types of violations will not happen in the future. So I'd ask you to take that into consideration that their new owners, uh, that they're trying their best. They did, they did obtain their entertainment license. It was in the process for about six months. Uh, they recently were able to, to obtain that license. So they do have that license in place now. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm they, I would help and entertain the questions as will they. Okay. Um, we're double checking which email we have um, in our records because that's the okay. email we would have sent the advisory to. I just want to let you know too that Captain Chicolo hand delivered these advisories to every place in the Bullfinch Triangle. So there's some breakdown in management there if you're saying that you were unaware of it. And just for the record, I'm looking right now, the email was sent to joe at jpatchansun.com, which is the email that the transfer application was submitted with. If that's not the correct contact information, please update that with the board. Yeah, so uh, Joseph Bacci was, um, he was a business partner and, you know, that didn't work out and he's no longer a part of uh, Venture 66. 
So um, that would definitely be the reason why, you know, he never informed us that he received that email. Okay, you have a responsibility to make sure that we have your updated information at all times. Um, as manager of record, we need to have a 24-hour contact for you, sure. as well as an, an updated email. So I suggest you or your attorney get us that information by the end of the day today. Of course. So this is what, six days later, and you're overcrowded again. Um, it doesn't sound like any lessons were learned from the earlier violation or communication wasn't made clear to your staff, or was it a question of you were listening to your landlord and not the police? And also, I, I, who is the landlord? I'm sorry, the, what, you want to speak? Yeah, you can, I don't, I don't know who the landlord is, Justin. So is it a company? Is it a person? Is it a business? Is my father. It's your father? Correct. Okay. So when Sergeant Gallagher called your father, and as it stated in the police report, the conversation went sour due yeah, to I disrespectful language. I can't speak on behalf of my father. He's not a part of the business. Again, he's just my landlord. Um, you know, I think it was reported to him that, you know, there was an incident and obviously, you know, being shut down and for the past two years and one of our biggest days of the year, I think uh, he just emotions were high and sure. they were just taken apart that, you know, he just hates to see, you know, us been struggling for all these past years being shut down and everything that, you know, something like this, um, you know, would close this. Obviously, it's no excuse. But um, if I were informed, I know, you know, the Tavern in the Square, a few other businesses were still open. I just, you know, we just weren't informed that, you know, by the fourth quarter, everyone should have been off the premises. Okay, this board is very well aware of how COVID has affected small businesses. And we've taken that into consideration for the last two years. But public safety issues like overcrowding are not for going sure. to look past, whether it's a um, Celtics game, a Bruins game, or a concert. So I'm going to say that for the record right now. Um, we we understand what you've gone through in the last two years. I think um, as, as chair of the board, and my fellow commissioners I and I have taken that into consideration, but being overcrowded two nights within a week, knowing that you're going to have a crowd, if you're not properly staffed, you know, you're going to end up being closed the next time, or you're going to have to close yourself. So um, I think it's very important that you understand that Captain Chicolo is trying to monitor the entire area on these very busy nights. His resources are limited. And if he makes the decision that people cannot be allowed in after a certain time, you need to respect that. Of, of course. Okay. And um, I don't know if, you know, this is no disrespect. I know, um, you know, previous during renovations with the uh, business partner of Joseph Pachi, uh, his architect had miss counted the occupancy which my dad previously had um, a count of 213 so we've been you know in the process since um as of march trying to get that new occupancy and i know you guys are backed up and and everything but you know i know there's no excuse but that's uh it's been in the works for a while we're still waiting for that you know increase. okay we don't know about that we're not backed up that's a, an issue you have with inspectional services so we're not aware that you're applying for that when our inspectors go out and inspect you. So okay. it's not like we can take that into consideration. Of course. I don't have any other questions. Commissioner Curran or Commissioner Saxon, do you? Thank you. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. The board will take this matter under advisement as well. Uh, okay, and, thank you. Yep, Thanks. and Attorney Amoroso or Mr. Pasquale, please do update the board with your correct contact information and a 24 hour contact, both uh, phone number and email. Licensing board at boston.gov. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number eight has also been continued at the request of the licensee and will be rescheduled to the next available hearing date. Those are all of the items before the board this morning. So that will adjourn this hearing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.